Welcome to another edition of Food, Faith, and Feelings, brought to you as an educational program under the nonprofit MANA Scholarship Fund. Our program is designed to help you better understand issues related to your physical and mental diet, what you consume that is impacting your head, your heart, and your soul. We are thankful to our business partnership with Paradigm Security and Mr. Rick Strawn for providing this opportunity to come to you today. We hope to enrich your lives as he has enriched ours. So I'm very excited about our guest today, Mr. Brian Cuban. Hello. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Oh, no. I I really feel very honored that you would be on my little bitty podcast. And I just like, so I am aware of who you are. Um, I know that you have a a kind of famous brother, uh, kind of famous, Um, but I would love for people to know you, like, who are you? What do you do? Well, I'm a, first and foremost, I am a person in long-term recovery uh, from uh, two different eating disorders, bulimia, traditional and exercise bulimia as well as uh, drug and alcohol addiction. I will have, uh, I'm going on my 15th year in recovery for all of those things uh, coming up pretty soon. And I'm a a non-practicing lawyer. I live in Dallas, Texas. I have two brothers, my older brother, Mark, of course, and a younger brother, Jeff. Uh, I've lived in Dallas since I graduated law school at the University of Pittsburgh in 1986. Before that, I went to Penn State undergrad and I was born and raised in Pittsburgh. So I'm just going to ask an obvious question. You love the Steelers, right? I bleed black and gold across the spectrum. So does my Steelers, husband. Steelers Pirates, Penguins, uh, whatever. Yes, he is totally a Steelers fan, loves them, and will be screaming at the TV every time mm-hmm. they're on. So, <laughs> so I, I want to d- just do a really deep dive with you. Um, I've listened to a couple of your other interviews. Um, And so what is fascinating for me is um, that you are so open and uh, so willing just to talk about um, your past, the trauma, um, your family issues, recovery process. Like, I I just think it's really amazing. You can tell that you've had quite a lot of therapy. So let me just talk a little bit about general eating disorders for a second. There are 10,000, an average of 10,200 deaths each year that are the direct result of an eating disorder. That is one death every 52 minutes. Most people do not understand that, but as you, I'm sure know, eating disorders are deadly. Have you, what was the worst part for you about your eating disorder? Oh man, the worst part for me was the, uh, the, the worst parts changed as you know, through different aspects of it. Uh, when I first began binging and purging, the worst part was the absolute con- shame of engaging, in, and this was 1979, engaging in an act that had not even yet become uh, ma- destigmatized to any extent for women either. Karen Carpenter, the singer, a uh, wonderful singer, wouldn't pass away from complications related to anorexia until 1983. So now I'm a guy binging and purging in 1979, going 18 years old. I believe bulimia had only been a clinical diagnosis since 1976 at that time. So I'm engaging in kind of an instinctive act that I didn't understand that made me feel okay for a few seconds, but then the all encompassing shame swept in. Mm -hmm. I don't know why I did it other than I felt, I don't want to get too triggering, so I won't get into any details, but uh, it just was an act that gave me maybe 10 or 15 seconds of normalcy. Like, but then uh, after that, I was just engulfed in sh- the shame of an 18-year-old man, male. Right. Uh, men, men just don't do that, right? Well, Even if I couldn't put a, di- a diagnosis on it, men right. just don't do that. Right. I, I also had bulimia. I started in 1983, and I, I didn't know what I was doing. I, I knew that I wanted to lose weight, and actually I watched a movie that basically – showed you how to do it. (laughs) And I know that it was a a movie that was intended to defer people and dissuade people, but it actually gave me an idea to do that. And um, so I'm very familiar as well with that feeling that washes over you that totally takes away all of your anxiety. Sure. And I had been there. I mean, there are pre 
there were uh, factors involved that certainly correlate with uh, eating disorders. I was, uh, I was trended on obese as a child. I was bullied severely, mm -hmm. even physically assaulted uh, related to my weight and uh, had some fat shaming at home. And I remember vividly, uh, I was at a, my first year at Penn State, I was at a branch campus near EPA. And so there weren't many places to eat. And there were these group of kids that went to a Perkins pancake house. And uh, it was an all you can eat. And I did what I did. And uh, I got back and there was so much shame mm. from uh, gorging myself. And it just seemed like the instinctive thing to do. And that was the first time. Was it? And how old were you? I was either 18 or just turning. I either just turned 18 or was about to turn 18. Okay. Yeah. Very, very young. So tell me this, how, how did you manage your shame? Like, did you know what that, what the shame, like, did, could you identify that shame feeling when you were that young? No, nah, I mean, no, nah, I don't, there was, there wasn't a name to it. Right. I didn't, didn't identify that shame. I feel ashamed. It was, how can I feel normal again? Well, by binging and purging again. Every time I might eat a little too much, how can I feel normal and not feel ucky? You know, just, yeah. you don't call it shame, just feel just feel uh, like no one could love me if I keep eating like this. And uh, if I do this or that, I won't be loved. And so it was, I managed the shame by doing it again. Sure. And again and again and again. One of the things that I typically talk about with my clients is that I believe that there's two primary motivators for human behavior, the desire for love and the desire for safety. And a lot of our addictive patterns are our, our way of trying to get that without having to depend on anyone else because people are dangerous. Sure. And the desire for love, I guess it would fall under it. The desire for peer acceptance is a powerful motivator as well. Uh, in my mind, I would, uh, again, I'd had some struggles with my mom. And so there were some love issues there, feeling loved, even though she loved me dearly. Yeah. But uh, there was, I would never be loved or accepted or have a date or kiss a girl if I didn't continue to engage in these behaviors, because if I allowed myself just to gorge, I would gain weight. And sure. I knew that gaining weight meant being bullied and uh, hating my and self-loathing. And so I had to maintain this precarious balance. And it was kind of the only thing I had control over in my life was the ability to maintain this precarious balance of weight and self-love and uh, in this and in, in, in engaging in this act. Right, right. Well, I, yes, I, I totally understand um, because kids, especially like younger kids, you know, we, we see eating disorders now as young as six, seven, eight years old. And the first thing that we can actually control is food. We don't sure. think about self-injury. We don't think about drugs. We don't think about alcohol, but food is something that we instinctively will utilize in order to help us feel whole and full and loved sure. because the initial, our initial connection with food is mom. And when we take that food in, it, it just helps us to feel you know, full of love. And so plus food tastes good. So being a man, I, I've written down some things about uh, the culture, about what men struggle with and deal with. Um, are you familiar with the Adonis complex? I'm sure you are. Sure. Yes. Sure. So just to let the, the listeners know, the Adonis complex is a pre This is for men traditionally preoccupation with an ideal body image stress associated with missing a workout, working out when, with, when you're injured, weak, being weak, uh, physically weak, emotionally weak is intolerable. There's a uh, typically a decreased interest in sex. There's testosterone use. So any, did you ever struggle with that? With that? Like, a, uh, I didn't, I didn't put it, I didn't put that definition on it, but sure. I mean, I've, uh, I almost lost my uh, left leg to anabolic steroid abuse. Wow. So uh, I uh, used a uh, dirty needle, and uh, we can go into all that, but uh, I uh, was abusing steroids, uh, anabolic steroids, and I hate the word abuse, but really with uh, illegal steroids, there's no other really term for it, right? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, I was, and it was beyond testosterone. I 
was getting uh, steroids on the black market. And, uh, it, but the, the thing was, is again, I was also, you know, the, the, a lot of this stemmed from body dysmorphia, body dysmorphic disorder that I would be diagnosed with in my 40s. So no matter how big I got, no matter how thin I got, I always saw this kind of just ugly, unlovable monster in the mirror. And so I was cycling through all of these destructive behaviors, whether it was the binging and purging, then I was running 10 and 20 miles a day while also binging and purging the exercise, believe me, I got into marathons and, and then the alcohol and the drugs, all trying to kind of instinctively uh, love myself and change this image that never changed, no matter how my body changed. So I'm very familiar with the Adonis complex. Yes. Well, and it sounds like your body really, you really had a a rough time with your body. Like I know a lot of people that have been physically and sexually abused will struggle with what their body contains. They can't separate out what they feel inside from what their body looks like. Sure. That, that, of course. Yes. I mean, how do you pull out, how do you uh, separate shame, right? From who you are. So that that's very common. And, And I'm frank today that my biggest struggle, it's not drugs, it's alcohol, it's my relationship with food and exercise is my biggest recovery struggle today. How would you, how would you encourage a man to identify and manage his shame? Shame. I I don't like the term managing shame. I, I, it's, uh, first off, I try to encourage people not to take the attitude, especially when we talk to others, that there's no reason to be ashamed. Right. I don't like people saying that because shame is a natural body defense mechanism. Mm-hmm. We deal when we tell people there's no reason to be ashamed, what we do is delegitimize what they're feeling. Right. Right. Well, then why do I feel this way? Right. There must be something wrong with me. So I try to get away from that type of language, stigmatizing language. So I encourage people when they're feeling shame to get into a safe place to explore the roots of it. Right. Because uh, when we carry shame, I so said, when I carried shame around in a suitcase, a little boy who felt ashamed, and I dragged that little boy over gravel roads through my life, decades attached to a tr- chain on a tractor tire, you know, oh, my entire life, just putting all the shame in the suitcase and it kept bulging and bulging until it explodes in some dysfunctional way. Mm-hmm. So you have to find a safe place to open up that suitcase. And that's what I tell males is for me, and I'm not an expert. If the only thing I'm an expert is my own story. I'm not a therapist. Right. Uh, for me personally, it wasn't about managing shame. It was about finding a safe place to release it. Yeah. And just for people- because You can manage shame by binging and purging. True. So, I, so that's why I'm very careful about using managing. Okay. In terms of identifying the shame, um, I think you said a couple of things, which I think are really good, just- ways for people to think about it. And that is, I just felt bad about myself. And that's what I have come to understand as a therapist that we, when, when someone rejects themselves and they don't, like you've, you've said, I, you know, hated myself. I've uh, loathed, had my self-loathing. Those are all different aspects and ways to verbalize what shame feels like. Do you have any other thoughts about that? Uh, sure. I mean, there are many ways. Uh, shame is, I mean, and it's, I mean, I feel like I, we're just going to talk about all the things that I've been told myself. I'm ugly. I'm not lovable. Uh, I'm not worthy of, uh, I'm not worthy of loving myself. I mean, these were all common conversations when I looked with myself, when I looked in the mirror Yeah. and, uh, and there, but there are also other ways that shame is expressed. So isolation that aren't verbal, uh, isolation, drug use, uh, eating disorders. So they're dysfunctional ways too. But it's, uh, from a verbalization standpoint, it was very common for me just to, to self, uh, legitimize, you know, myself just looking in the mirror and just say, never having a conversation that didn't involve self-hatred and legitimizing. This is why you're not going out. This is why you're not dating. This is why your mother, you know, doesn't love you. And these were the things I convinced myself of, even though she did. Right. These, this is why you were divorced three times. All these things, you just legitimize it so you don't have to feel ashamed. Mm-hmm. Maybe that's a way of managing it, right? Maybe that's a way you're talking about managing shame. 
Yeah, exactly. And so what was the turning point for you? What, what was the final straw? I mean, you've talked about, and thank you for talking about the, the first time that you engaged in one of these acting out behaviors. So what was the turning point for you in getting help and getting healthy? Uh, the turning point was, wasn't necessarily related to my eating disorder. The turning point was uh, Easter weekend, 2007, when I had a uh, uh, alcohol-induced blackout and uh, ended up at a psychiatric hospital for my second time. The first was after a near suicide attempt in 2005. Wow. And uh, that, uh, that is when I actually finally started getting honest with my therapist and told him for the first time that I binged and purged. And so that was the trigger was the drug and alcohol blackout. But I finally decided that it was time to get honest about these other things. So that was the beginning. So I wonder what made that the hardest thing to uh, own up to be, you know, I mean, because of the culture of eating disorders and the stigma around eating disorders. I mean, at that point, I'm in my mid 40s. That was uh, 2007. So uh, 40, what was I? 46. Mm -hmm. So I knew I had, at that point, I knew I was dealing with bulimia, right? Yeah. Uh, I did, really didn't understand what exercise bulimia was even at that point, but I knew I was dealing with traditional bulimia. And so I knew I had an eating disorder. I'm, I mean, I'm not stupid. No, you're not. <laughs> yeah. Not to imply that you're stupid if you're avoiding it, but I, I knew what binging and purging was. But I was ashamed because it was just... In my mind, uh, even though I had the internet, I, I was too afraid to even do much research because every bone in my body told me that uh, I was the only male in the world who was struggling with these things. Even though intellectually I knew that wasn't true, emotionally I felt that way. Right. And so if I'm the only male in the world struggling with these things, I'm going to get laughed at if I reveal it to anyone. No one's going to believe me. And it's still the one thing that I own and I can control. Yeah. So, even in my 40s. So now, even you know, the listeners that are hearing our podcast, I know you have a ton of other podcasts out there. Um, so the listeners now, maybe some of the guys that are out there that might be struggling with eating disorders, e whether that's anorexia, bulimia. Well, anorexia is not eating enough food in general. And you know, bulimia is eating a lot of food and then throwing it up and then binge eating disorder, which I think is pretty, pretty, it's done a lot, but it is not discussed a lot. And I think most men probably deal with binge eating disorder. Uh, well, we know that it's the fastest growing eating disorder, at least as of a couple of years ago. I don't know what the stats right now were and it, it impacts males, you know, predominantly. So we do know that, but uh, I would tell them that not to delegitimize the shame. The shame is a normal body reaction that has been given to us by evolution. And so, but for me, the process of dealing with my own shame and finding a safe place began in therapy. Mm -hmm. And so, and that's scary. And I know it's hard. And that was scary for me to utter those first words. It was on the tip of my tongue so many times with my therapist, but I never managed to get it out lie, lie, lie. Well, why would you lie to your therapist? Shame knows no hourly rate, does it? It doesn't. <laughs> oh, I've never heard that. That's good. <laughs> and, That's right. uh, but uh, the, the, the scariest thing about shame is releasing it to somebody and releasing our pain, but in a safe place, it can be therapeutic. Right. And I encourage people to think about that. And I'm not going to tell you that it's easy. Right. Uh, recovery is rarely a straight line. Nope. But the first step is releasing, uh, finding an outlet for the shame. For me, it was. Right. And I think that inside of all of the things that you're saying is courage because shame is an element of pain. I mean, pain is that stuff that we don't like to feel. Yeah. We don't like to think about. We don't like to talk about because a lot of people in the world just don't know how to cope with it. Yeah. Uh, and, and then again, we, we talk about, and again, I, I, I stay away from whether it's courage or not, you know, just it's normal, right? I mean, what you're feeling is, is not unusual and you're not the only person going through it, whether recovery is courageous or whatever term we want to put on it, right? You know, we, these things don't re generally resolve on their own and, uh, and shame is the linchpin. Shame is, in my opinion, is the linchpin. So find a place to safely unleash it and, and you're not going to be judged. You're not going to be judged. I know we project 
we recover, we project, we project, we project that I will be judged. And it becomes a self-reinforcing thing where, well, that's why I'm not going to tell anyone. And so, but to find a safe place, you're not going to be judged. You're going to be supported. And that's scary, I know. And right. uh, the first step always is. Right. So throughout your, I think you said before that you had 17 years of working on yourself, correct? Therapy. Fluent therapy. Yeah. So is there, um, when you're hit with a, a hard feeling or um, a difficult situation, is there a thought process or a mantra that you use to sort of help you work through that? Sure. The first is what I've learned uh, in eating disorder recovery is I am not my thoughts. And we learned that in cognitive behavioral therapy, which I've been through a lot. I am not my thoughts. Uh, it is normal to have negative thoughts in a day. The majority of them are negative, right? Over 50% of our thoughts in any given day are negative and uh, negative self-talk. And so what's my positive self-talk? Why am I thinking this? Where does this come from? Where is this coming from? And how, what, what are my healthy outlets? For, for these thoughts? Am I going to call my, am I going to call my therapist? Am I going to talk to my wife? Am I going to have a conversation with my brothers? Am I going to write about it? Am I going to blog about it? What are the healthy outlets? And what am I not going to do? I am not going to binge and purge. I am not going to obsess about binging and purging. I am not going to spend time on thinking about that, uh, that moment of calm from when I was 18 years old. Oh, this might work, right? I'm going to pull open my toolbox that has taken me decades to fill and find the healthy outlets for it. Great. Well, and, and you, you mentioned writing. So I know that you have written at least two books, correct? Shattered image is primarily about my body image struggles in eating disorders. And the addicted lawyer is more about my struggles with drug and alcohol addiction. And the addicted lawyer is, isn't that the new one that's coming out? Oh, that's the ambulance chaser. That's fiction. That's my novel. Oh, okay. I'm so, sorry. You have three books then. Yes, I have three books, but the, the, the current one that comes out in December is a novel. Yes. And my mom is looking forward to reading. That. Well, I thank her for pre-ordering it. <laughs> so, um, all right. So people can, um, get your books and more information about you on where at either briancuban.com or authorbriancuban.com. Great. Is there anything else, Brian, that you would like to say to encourage people on recovery? Dealing recovery is, is uh, eating disorders are, are difficult uh, recovery wise, and uh, but uh, it is possible. Mm -hmm. uh, there, it is a journey mm -hmm. and you are loved and there are people who want to help you. And if you don't know who to reach out to, reach out to me. Oh, and I'll help you find a way, you know, I'll, I'll try to be your wingman in a path. I can't make you recover. I'm not a therapist, but if you are afraid, if you haven't told anyone and you need someone to tell, reach out to me. Right. I've been there. I get it. And I will just piggyback on that and say that, um, the organization that I started 15, 16 years ago is called mana fund. So manafund.org has scholarships for people who need any level of care. So intensive, like in the hospital, residential, and then we have a local program here in Atlanta, PHP, IOP, and outpatient. And thank you for doing that. We help everyone. We don't, I wish we had more money, but <laughs> we can help more people. Yeah. And there are all kinds of resources. Yours is wonderful. Thank you. There's, if you're looking, obviously need is out there. There's Project Heal, uh, which I sit on the advisory board. So there's eating disorder hope. There are, there are many, re that's, that's all, sometimes one of the issues. Even in the era of the internet, people just aren't aware of how many support resources are out there. That, uh, but we do need more. Uh, we, need, we need mail beds. We need money for treatment. We need better insurance coverage. There are all kinds of things going on here. Amen. And I know that uh, there are a lot of people who are working the, the ground in um, Washington, D.C. and trying to get everything helped, you know, covered yeah. and, and all that. And, and there's a lot of online support. I can help you with that, too. So if you're struggling and you're feeling alone, you're not alone. Pick me up. Great. Well, I appreciate it. And again, um, just wanting to let people know that MANA is also here to help. We are in the process of raising funds to create a recovery, not 
a, a recovery residence so that if you don't have a safe place, MANA is creating this place for you. If you are too far away, if you're out of state and you need the treatment and you can't afford it, then we are creating a recovery residence here in Georgia. And we're looking, we're raising the money right now for purchasing that in the new year. In the meantime, you can call us at 770-795-9775. We provide, like I said, treatment and scholarships for eating disorder, as well as trauma recovery. We are developing and starting a trauma intensive outpatient program. So we're trying to help people in lots of different ways. Brian, I really, really appreciate you spending your time with me. And is there just anything else that you'd like to let people know? Just one day, eating recovery is like uh, addiction recovery, one day at a time. Just take it one day at a time. Yeah. My dad is um, also in the recovery process and on his recovery journey. And he always says, just do the next right thing. Yeah. And so do the next right thing for you. Take care of yourself. Thank you. And thank you for having me on. Thank you, Brian. I really appreciate you. So thank you so much for joining us on Food, Faith, and Feelings, presented by Paradigm Security Services and the MANA Fund. Don't forget that you can enjoy any of our episodes anytime by visiting businessradiox.com, selecting the Gwinnett Studio, and then clicking on Food, Faith, and Feelings. This program is also available on Apple iTunes, iHeartRadio, Spotify, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. Until next time, I am Dr. Jeannie Burnett, and you've been listening to Food, Faith, and Feelings on Business Radio X.